Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Monique Knappen, and as director of the John Adams Institute, I'm very happy you're all here tonight. As most of you know, uh, we have had bestseller authors that's like John Irving, Michael Cunningham, Saul Bellow, Gore Vidal, and even Donna Tartt. But I think we are nowadays even more proud to have new, young, bright writers, such as Jonathan Franzen, Jonathan Safran Foer, Chang Wei Li. This last author, Chang Wei Li, he was here in this church a year ago, was the discoverer of the author of tonight, Gary Steingart. His book, The Russian Debutant's Handbook, was out only last summer in the United States and was being reviewed as one of the best debuts of that year. I'm very pleased he's here. Um, I'm also very pleased that Bert Bakker, the, his Dutch publisher, um, bought the rights and uh, got the book here. It was only out here in the beginning of March, so you're all like avant-garde uh, audience, I think. It's very good. And uh, I want to thank um, Bert Bakker for doing that because it's, I think it's quite courageous in these days. Tonight's moderator and introducer of Gary Steingart is Hermann Stevens. Stevens is an author of already four books, but he also scouts out all the remarkable books from the United States. He was very, very quick in reviewing the Russian debutant's handbook. He did it already in August last year, so I think that's really remarkable too. Well, the layout of tonight's evening is as usual. The John Adams' lectures are always with a short introduction by Hermann Stevens this time, and then um, we'll have the pleasure of listening to our main guest, Gary Steingart. He will talk for about 30 minutes, and then um, we'll have an interview here on this um, floor. And as usual, you will be allowed to participate in the discussion, and we'll hope that you will do, and there is a microphone to be used. Um, please switch off your mobile phones, otherwise we'll get interrupted by that. And Herman, would you be so kind to take the floor? Thank you. That's the music. Um, once out in California, uh, I heard a radio interview with the British writer Martin Amos. The reporter asked who his favorite writers were, and um, Amos said to him, Vladimir Nabokov and Saul Bellow were the best writers of the 20th century. Oh, said the reporter, so you really like American writers, don't you? Of course, Amos said he did, but he also said the interesting thing about those two writers was that they were essentially Russian writers who just happened to take America as their subject. Amos's observation is interesting as it applies to so much of America's modern literature and arts. The composer Stravinsky lived for most of his mature years in Los Angeles. The painter Marth Rothko was born Marcus Rothkowitz in Russia. The New York City Ballet's lifeblood consists of the works of George Balanchine, a Petersburg kid. And half the string section of most major orchestras in the US consists of second or third generation Russian Americans. Of course, I don't wish to upset the board of the John Adams Institute, who's been so kind to host this evening, but America's high culture since the 1940s has less to do with the eminently sane founding fathers of the American Republic. It is much more inspired by the inherently crazy legacy of Tolstoy, Pushkin, and all kinds of old world mysticism. I was reminded of this as I was reading Gary Steingart's wonderful first novel, The Russian Debutant's Handbook. Steingart clearly is another exponent of this powerful strain in American literature. We've just forgotten this strain is still alive and well. Steingart was born in 72 in Leningrad and emigrated along with his parents to the US seven years later, thanks to a Brezhnev era deal described in the Russian debutant's handbook. And I'm quoting. In the late 70s, the gentle, toothy American Jimmy Carter swapped tons of Midwestern grain for tons of Soviet Jews. And suddenly, Vladimir and grandmother found themselves walking out of the International Arrivals Building at JFK. They took one look at the endless America before them and cried in each other's arms. 10 years later, Steingart entered Oberlin College, invariably described in the novel as a progressive Midwestern college 
where you learn about political correctness and getting wasted. Still, after four expensive years of education, Steingart, just like his alter ego in the book, Vladimir Gershkin, ends up with a desk job at the Emma Lazarus Immigrant Absorption Society, an institute for mostly third world immigrants helping to find their way in American society, even though Steingart hadn't found his way himself. It was not a good job. Perhaps though, it was just a way for Steingart to keep his mind clear for fiction writing. A large part of the Russian debutant's handbook was written, in off was written in office hours, as it was Steingart's objective to turn the manuscript in as a way to get back into school and learn how to write. Anyone who's read 10 pages of this novel knows that there's very little Steingart needed to learn about writing fiction. It's the most accomplished first novel in years. Chang Rai Li, novelist and director of Hunter College's writing program, to whom the application in novel form was sent, didn't waste any time considering Steingart as a student. This was a writer, period. Li forwarded the manuscript to his agent, and it didn't take long for Steingart to sign a book deal with the publisher. And that's how this debut novel entered our world. The Russian Debutant's Handbook is a novel about immigration and displacement. However, what makes it different from the fiction of previous generations of immigrants, Steingart's picaresque novel is not about achieving success. It's about achieving failure. At a time we are being shown on an hourly basis images of American troops liberating rather unjubilant Iraqis, Steingart's novel asks the question, what if I'm not fit for the American way? What if I'm just too lazy? What if I'm just old world? Vladimir Gershkin, Steingart's protagonist, is the son of immigrant parents to whom the TV show Dallas is the encyclopedia of American life. Greed is good, success is everything, there's only one way up, no, there's only one way and that's up. Their move to the US had been a tremendous success in terms of freedom and finances. Gershkin's father is a doctor specializing in insurance fraud. His mother is a banker. Vladimir is different, though. If his parents are alpha immigrants, he is a better immigrant. He doesn't want to go up, down, or anywhere. If that makes him a failure, it's fine by him. His mother affectionately calls him Felurshka, her darling little failure. In one of his many lyrical and sarcastic moments, Vladimir describes himself as the immigrant's immigrant the expatriate's expatriate, the enduring victim of every practical joke the late 20th century had to offer, and an unlikely hero for our times. Still, this sounds like the recipe for another motionless, actionless, Oblomov kind of novel. But this is where Steingart's uncanny skill as a writer comes in. He turns his latter-day Oblomov into a picaresque hero of our times. He's a sly survivor. Vladimir wants to be left alone, just like the disaffected 19th century gentleman Olomov. However, in a modern capitalist society, no matter whether we're talking about America, post-communist Russia, or fictionalized locations like Prava in the cafeteria of Republic of Stelovaya, the Paris of the East, one can only satisfy one's desire to be left alone by working, and working real hard, and so, the final irony of this hilarious, affecting, and hugely entertaining novel seems to be that there's only one way to escape the American way of life, and that's the American way. Now, I'm not going to tell you a single thing more about this novel, which I truly love and admire, except that it ends happily with Vladimir pronouncing himself the best of both worlds, 50% functional American and 50% cultured Eastern European in need of a haircut and a bath. I want you to get a copy for yourself and read it like a clean slate. And that's why I'd like to ask Gary Steingart to take my place and talk about the Russian debutant's handbook. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, I've explained a couple of things to me as well. Uh, but I appreciate especially the idea of the art of failure. I think this is 
something I've been trying for for all my life, and success only hampers it. Um, and I also want to thank very much uh, the John Adams Institute for extending this invitation. It has been a very hospitable visit, and Amsterdam has always been one of my favorite cities by far. And very often I'm returning from the eastern part of, of, our, of Europe, and I fly into Amsterdam, and just seeing Schiphol Airport from your Aeroflot window is, is a very touching kind of return, and yes. So um, much has been said, uh, but I will just, uh, I don't, don't wish to bore you, I will just briefly describe uh, how I got here, yes? And then I'll read uh, maybe 15 minutes from the book, and if you start to get bored, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll stop. So as, as was mentioned, I was born in Leningrad in USSR, this is 1972, which was the middle of the Brezhnev era, and my first language was Russian and I started to write very early on. I think I was about four or five years old when I started writing my first uh, so-called novel. Uh, back then I loved these little children's fairy tales about Lenin, the exalted Soviet leader. And my favorite was Lenin hiding from the Tsar's police in this little hut that he had built with his own hands. And I also loved this Swedish tale about a famous goose named Goose Martin. I don't know if you're familiar with this goose. Uh, and he got into all these adventures with this boy, uh, this uh, friend of his named Niels. So my first novel, of course, was a combination of Lenin hiding in his little hut along with Goose Martin. Lenin and the goose become very good friends, although in reality Lenin would have probably eaten the goose or at least had him purged very quickly. And my first publisher was my grandmother. Uh, she was very encouraging and she paid me in cheese. I think it was something like three slices of cheese per every page I wrote. Uh, extra butter when I wrote something very nice. Now, I was not a very hungry kid, and, uh, the, but I think it was the cheese that kept me going. It was awful cheese made from some second-rate Soviet cow, but it tasted really fine to me. And when I write even now, I like, like to nibble on some Roquefort or some uh, Edam from, from this part of the world. It was a good Soviet childhood as far as these childhoods go. We were a very musical family. My father, my mother taught in piano school, and my aunt was a violin player and my father was a failed opera singer. So naturally I was forced to play the violin and the piano, but the only thing I wanted to do was to write and to earn cheese. In Leningrad in that day, words were everywhere. You'd walk outside and you'd see these giant socialist placards nailed to the tops of buildings or written in huge capital letters in the metro stations. I remember some of them. 1934, Soviet scientists create the first chain reaction. 1959, Soviet space rocket reaches the surface of the moon. Or the ubiquitous glory to socialist labor. And I remember standing there in front of these giant letters and reading them over and over again. It was pretty crude propaganda, but for a little five-year-old kid, it seemed that words had a power that nothing could rival, certainly not music. After we received permission to emigrate in 1979, our first stop was Rome. It was a layover for Soviet Jews on the way to America or Israel at the time. It was there while awaiting our papers to, for a settlement in the United States that my father told me it was all a lie. Lenin, his self-made hut that I had written so much about, the Red Army that I had hoped one day to join, all the propaganda in the metro, the Soviet Union itself, all of it a lie. I was six years old and he broke my heart. I felt a sense of betrayal which would become a major theme in the Russian debutante's handbook. And yet at that tender age, I already possessed one of the immigrants' most important skills, the ability to adjust my values and shed any unnecessary beliefs at will. From that point on, communism and the Soviet Union was bad. America and Ronald Reagan, God help me, was good. Lately, I read a, a great book, which I reviewed for the New York Times uh, book review uh, by a Yugoslav writer, maybe some of you know him, Alexander Heman. Sasha Heman is how he prefers to be called. The book is called Nowhere Man. And Heman writes about growing up in Sarajevo in the 1980s under the communist regime there and how it was the best time a kid could have. And I would have to agree with him there. Growing up in Russia, I was too young to know the true nature of the Soviet state. I loved the Red Army with all my heart. So for me, my Russian childhood was a magical time, a time when I learned to love language, when I had the first inkling that I would someday become a writer. Coming to America, assimilating into that culture was very difficult. 
This was during the beginning of the Soviet incursion into Afghanistan, and all things Russian were suspect and to be derided. I remember how I was wearing my very fine Soviet fur coat made out of a bear or an elk or some other fierce woodland animal when my first grade teacher took me aside and said, you can't wear that anymore here, I'm sorry. And that's how it was back then. The immigrant was pressed into the bosom of his new society, given a crash course in Americanisms. The idea of multiculturalism was not very big in Queens, New York at that time. And partly my difficulties in assimilating were due to the issue of language. Unlike many immigrants, my parents allowed only Russian to be spoken in the home. Also, we could not afford a television, and when we finally found the little black and white zenith in the trash can outside our building, I was only allowed to watch it for half an hour a week. It was an extreme situation. Without television, I found that I had absolutely nothing to talk about with any of the children at school. It was literally impossible at that time, in the early 1980s, and possibly today, I don't know, I don't have children, uh, to hear a sentence spoken by a child without an allusion to something that was happening on TV. So I found myself doubly handicapped, living in a world where I spoke neither the actual language, English, nor the second and almost just as important language, television. Naturally, I turned inward. I began writing. As a 10-year-old, I would write more per day than I write today, sadly enough. I wrote first in Russian, then in a mix of Russian and English, then just finally in English. I was sent to a Hebrew school at the time, a little place in Queens, so I had to learn yet another language, Hebrew. I wasn't very good at Hebrew, and I could make no sense of Judaism whatsoever. I tried hard, but I always managed to do the wrong thing, sing the wrong prayer at the wrong time. So I set about writing my own Torah. The Torah is the Jewish Bible, which I called the Gonorrah for very complicated reasons. The Gonorrah was, let's just say, a very libertine version of the original with lots of musical numbers, singing prophets, lots of blasphemous fun. Sexodus was a chapter instead of Exodus. And it was written on an actual scroll, which I somehow managed to type up sideways so that it looked, you know, like an actual uh, Torah looked. But the Gonorrah became quite popular in our school. I was almost thrown out for it. It was quite a relief from the rote memorization of the Talmud and all the other glum yeshiva learning. The Gonorrah reinforced what I had known all along, that words mattered, that they could compel even these kids around me who spent all their time watching television, that they could make these kids listen. And like me, that was important too. The Gonorrah made me my first American friends. And then my writing career was stalled. My parents finally gave up on the no television rule. We were not so poor anymore and we could shell out 1,000 US dollars on a salmon colored 27 inch Sony Trinitron. The delivery of the salmon colored 27 inch Sony Trinitron was possibly the happiest moment of my life. It was like finally becoming a naturalized citizen of the United States. I turned it on and I never turned it off. For the next 10 years I would write almost nothing and read almost nothing. I soon discovered, as was mentioned, the endless pleasures of the television show Dallas. Over a supper of Russian farmer's cheese and tea, my mother and I cheered on the evil villain, J.R., as he screwed over everyone in sight, raising Texas dust behind his sleek Mercedes convertible. Every penny I earned doing chores was spent decorating my office to resemble J.R.'s office. <laughs> Luckily, it already came with the requisite wood paneling. And to further the look, I soon installed a little computer. Back then, they were not, not so common. A fancy-looking telephone with an LCD display and a luxurious chair. All I needed was a model golden oil derrick that JR had to make the look complete. But even without the derrick, I would purposely stride into my so-called office, grab the expensive phone I had bought, and say with what I thought was a Texas accent, you just hang tight, darling, I'll be right there. I was maybe 13, a small immigrant boy with asthma, just learning to twist his mouth around the English language. But I knew what I wanted. America was going to make me rich, which is what America does. After Hebrew school and my early JR worship, I attended uh, Stuyvesant High School, an elite math and science high school in Manhattan, uh, where the student body was composed overwhelmingly of ambitious immigrant children. Work hard, please your parents, make a killing. These were the three unspoken principles of Stuyvesant High School, and perhaps a fourth, sometimes conflicting tenet, become an American. We chided each other for our perceived un-Americanisms. The wrong shirt tucked too tightly into the wrong pants. The wrong accent to Queens or to Chinatown. The wrong lunch, homemade squid and noodles instead of a pizza burger at the local diner. The most vicious insult, one that circulated mainly among the Asian kids but haunted the rest of us immigrants as well, was FOTB or fresh off the boat. I tried to avoid the FOTB label by wearing a sweatshirt featuring teenage surfers alongside for some reasons a kangaroo and an Australian flag. 
I ate only pizza burgers and mindful of the sound my, mind, my mouth made, hardly said a word to anyone, often hiding out in the bathroom during my lunch break where some rebellious Chinese kids smoked cigarettes at each other. In our spare time, we planned which law or medical school we would attend. Many of these kids, although they were still only in high school, were already practicing for their law school admission tests or their MCATs, as for the medical schools, never mind their SATs. They were, just like their immigrant parents, just like my immigrant parents, already thinking five or six years into the future. I was saved from becoming yet another Russian yuppie, or Yuri, as they call us, that's young urban Russian immigrant, Yuri, by my choice of college. Vladimir Gershkin, the hero of the Russian debutante's handbook, stumbled into my life my senior year at Oberlin College in Ohio, a peculiar place in the middle of nowhere, a liberal college where almost everyone was an English or writing major or else played the oboe in the conservatory. It's a long story how I got there instead of the more obvious choice of, say, Cornell, where many immigrants would go. Suffice to say there was a very young woman involved and I ended up in Ohio. I had decided to take some creative writing classes to try to reconnect with what had once been the center of my life, writing. In the beginning, I wrote these little stories that in some way were an homage to Russian Jewish immigrants, my parents, myself, and others. And I wrote these for a while, but they somehow felt fake, as if I was omitting something, choosing not to go into more dangerous territory. When I found my hero, Vladimir Gershkin, I knew that I had something different on my hands. As has just been said, Gershkin's father was a Russian doctor who gleefully committed Medicare fraud. His mother, a crazed Westchester moneymaker, dubbed her poor son Failurchka, or little failure. His latest friend was an old Russian sailor who had meaningful conversations with a small household fan and lusted after President Clinton's daughter. And then there was the murderous groundhog, about whom the less said the better. This was no homage to an immigrant's family's perseverance. It felt almost like an act of betrayal. It felt like something a good immigrant kid shouldn't write. So I didn't know what to think. After 14 years of being an immigrant in America, I still had no idea what made Russians of my generation tick, not to mention my parents and their generation. I was groping some, for some kind of solution, and the only thing I could come up with was humor. Now, just to mention, by this point, immigrant books were selling like hotcakes. Everyone was in on the action, Haitian, Chinese, Indians, Dominicans. But guess what? No Russians, not of my generation. What was going on here? We were all crammed full of Pushkin and Chekhov as children. With a literary legacy like ours, why weren't young Russians publishing books about our immigrant experience in America? So I got busy. I immersed myself in who we were. What I realized was that in some ways we were a raw and uncooked people. A Herald Tribune writer, a very perceptive one, once called our condition, and I quote, the cloying closeness of the Russian family. We had been bunched together like proverbial rabbits in tiny Soviet communal apartments. The word privacy didn't exist in the Russian language and the shadow of Stalin pursued us. There was, for instance, an apartment building in Queens in New York full of old Russian grandmas who would literally denounce each other to the Social Security Administration and other government agencies. They would call up these agencies and say, Maria Ivanovna in apartment 2C is a bad woman. She is stealing. I have a friend who runs a Russian radio talk show in New York, and he has a kind of informal denunciation hour where old people call and denounce each other and turn in their neighbors on the air. In a sense, we brought the Soviet Union with us. As Vladimir Gershkin, my hero, says in the novel, you can emigrate to sunny Brisbane or Chicago's Gold Coast, but if you grew up under that system, that precious gray planet of our fathers and forefathers, in some ways, you're marked for life. There's no way out. I agreed, there was no way out. I wrote and I wrote. I worked a number of nonprofit jobs. I traveled Vladimir Gershkin's shadow to Prague, Berlin, Amsterdam and to our common birthplace, Leningrad, or rather, St. Petersburg. Meanwhile, in all these places, I was trying to live the happy-go-lucky life of a 20-something American, but Vladimir Gershkin kept pulling me back to my computer. As for my influence as well, Nabokov's book told me to mind my language. Philip Roth's books told me to mind my family. At one point, I had close to 700 pages of, of work, and I learned to love Vladimir Gershkin as warmly as you can love someone who isn't real. And I finished the last corrections to the novel, fittingly enough, in a corner of the former Soviet Union, Baku, Azerbaijan, an oil-rich republic on the Caspian Sea where I was researching my second novel. I was writing in a shoddy hotel room which I shared with many roaches and a mysterious green spider who lived in his corner of the bathroom. His name was Malik the Spider. And one summer day, the temperature was 108 degrees Fahrenheit. I reached the end. I would email my editor in New York with the final changes the next day. And I remember that day so clearly. 
The sun was setting over the Caspian Sea. The oil derricks shimmered in the distance. Young Muslim girls promenaded on the beach in these incredibly short skirts. I was on the last page, and with the exception of the day we bought the Sony Trinitron so many years ago, it was the happiest moment in my life. And I'll never have it again because I'll never finish a first novel again. And most of all, I miss Vladimir Gershkin. He was my alter ego, and he was once very close to me, like a best friend. And now he's gone, relinquished to the text. And another thing I'll miss, I'll never be paid for my work in cheese ever again. Thank you. So let me hop ahead, and we'll do a little reading from the book. So we'll start at the beginning, and then a little kangaroo jump. The story of Vladimir Gershkin, part P.T. Barnum, part V.I. Lenin, the man who would conquer half of Europe, albeit the wrong half, begins the way so many other things begin, on a Monday morning, in an office, with the first cup of coffee gurgling to life in the common lounge. His story begins in New York, on the corner of Broadway and Battery Place, the most disheveled, godforsaken, not-for-profit corner of New York's financial district. On the 10th floor, the Emma Lazarus Immigrant Absorption Society greeted its clients with the familiar yellow water-stained walls and dying hydrangeas of a sad third-world government office. In the reception room, under the gentle but insistent prodding of trained assimilation facilitators, Turks and Kurds called a truce, Tutsis queued patiently behind Hutus, Serbs chatted up Croats by the demilitarized water fountain. Meanwhile, in the cluttered back office, junior clerk Vladimir Gershkin, as we've said, the immigrant's immigrant, the expatriate's expatriate, enduring victim of every practical joke the late 20th century had to offer, and an unlikely hero for our time, was going at it with the morning's first double-cured spicy soprasada and avocado sandwich. How Vladimir loved the unforgiving hardness of the soprasada and the fatty undertow of the tender avocado. The proliferation of this kind of Janus face sandwich, as far as he was concerned, was the best thing about Manhattan in the summer of 1993. Now we skip ahead a little bit, it's still the summer of 1993, and Vladimir Gershkin has found himself his first American, very wealthy American girlfriend. Her name is Francesca, and they're going to go shopping for a toothbrush together. They had gone shopping for a toothbrush. At no time was he happier than when the two of them would embark on these most mundane of missions. A man and a woman can claim to love one another. They may even rent real estate in Brooklyn as a sign of their love. But when they take time out of a busy day to walk through the air-conditioned aisles of a drug mart to pick out a nail clipper together, well, this is the kind of a relationship that will perpetuate itself, if only through its banality. And she was such a thoughtful consumer. The toothbrush, for instance, had to be organic. A dealership of organic toothbrushes did exist in Soho, but it had chosen this particular day to dissolve into bankruptcy. Strange, Franny said, as a person-sized toothbrush was removed from the vitrine by the bickering members of an Indian family and crammed into a station wagon with New Jersey license plates. They had such a following, she said. Oh, what is to be done, Vladimir moaned on her behalf. Where can one find an organic toothbrush in this one-horse town? Chelsea, she said, 28th and 8th. I think the place is called Tea Brush. Minimalist, but definitely organic. But you don't have to go all the way up there with me. Go home and keep my mother company. She's grilling baby squid in its own ink. You love that shit. No, 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 Vladimir said. I promised to go toothbrush shopping with you. Vlad, you're too much, she laughed, poking him in the stomach. Sometimes, she said, you seem so happy to have a girlfriend. Was this what you dreamed it would be like? Having a New York girlfriend, shadowing her around town, the devoted boyfriend, so loving, so devoid of any personal interest, just this lovey-dovey, dopey, happy guy. Toothbrush, don't mind if I do. You have a point, Vladimir said. He was unsure of what to say next. He felt a gurgle in his stomach and tasted something gastric on his tongue. Very well then, he said. No problem, he pecked her farewell. Chow, chow, he croaked. Good luck with the toothbrush. Remember, medium soft bristles. But as he made his way home, the intestinal ill feeling, the nervousness tickling his insides continued, as if the tired faces of the shish kebab sellers and art book hawkers of Lower Broadway, the honored citizens of the midsummer city, were assaying him with open disgust, as if the bragadocio of rap issuing out of boomboxes was actually as threatening as it sounded. What was it, this strange stirring? 
Back at her parents' house, Fran's bedroom was its usual mess of samizdat-like books published by failing presses, heaps of dirty underwear, here and there loose dots of birth control and anxiety medication, the big cat Krapotkin prowling about, tasting a little bit of everything, depositing tufts of gray-black fur on panties and literature alike. And the chill in the room, the mausoleum effect, the windows shut, curtains drawn, the air conditioner always on, the tiny desk lamp, the only illumination. Here was the long winter of Oslo or Fairbanks or Murmansk. The New York summer had no business in this twilight place, this temple to Fran's strange ambitions, the desiccation of early 20th century literature, the education and repackaging of one Warsaw Pact immigrant. His stomach growled once more, and then he realized what it was, this rumbling in his gullet, this internal displacement. He had been unmasked. She knew, she knew everything, how much he needed her, wanted her, could never have her. All of it, the foreigner, the exchange student, the 1979 Soviet grain Jew poster boy. Good enough for bed, but not for the organic toothbrush store. So that's how it was. She had humiliated him on the sly while he, the diligent note taker, had failed his mandate once again. And he had tried so hard this time, had gone to such lengths to please all of them under the rubric, parents and daughter, how to love an American family. He was the dutiful son they never had, worshiping them, shadowing them, soaking them up through osmosis, and still coming up short. Why? How? Because he was all alone in this, this being Vladimir Gershkin business, this being neither here nor there, neither Leningrad nor Soho. Sure, his problems might seem minuscule to a contemporary statistician of race, class, and gender in America. And yes, people in this country suffered left and right, were marginalized and disenfranchised the moment they stepped out of the house for coffee and a donut. But at least they suffered as part of a unit. They were in this together. They were bound by ties Vladimir could barely comprehend. New Jersey Indians joining a, uh, loading a giant toothbrush into a station wagon, Avenue B Dominicans playing stoop-side dominoes, even the native-born Judeo-Americans sharing easy laughs at the office. Where was Vladimir's social unit? He had no Russian friends. For all his years at the Emma Lazarus Immigrant Absorption Society, the Russian community was just a dark, perspiring mass that regularly washed up on his shore, complaining, threatening, cajoling, bribing him with bizarre lacquered tea sets and bottles of Soviet champagne. What could he do? Go to Brighton Beach and eat mutton plov with some off-the-boat Uzbeks? Arrange for a date with some Yelena Kupcharovskaya of Rigo Park, Queens, soon to be graduate of the accounting department at Baruch College, a woman who, if she actually existed, would want to settle down at the fantastic age of 21 and bear him two children in quick succession. Oh, Valodya, my dream is for one boy and one girl. The only Russian worth noting was his new friend, the crazed invalid Mr. Rybakov. They would eat herring together and sing Odessa gangster songs about a girl named Murka. Murka, oh my Murka, oh my darling Murka. Hello, my Murka, and goodbye. You screwed up our romance, oh my darling Murka, and for that, my Murka, you must die. And what of his parents, beyond the Maginot line of the Westchester suburbs, were they faring any better? Dr. and Mrs. Gershkin had arrived in the States in their early 40s. Their lives had effectively been split into two, leaving only fading memories of the sunny Yalta vacations, the homemade marzipan cookies and condensed milk the tiny private parties at some artist's flat suffused with moonshine vodka and whispered Brezhnev jokes. They had left their rarefied Petersburg friends, their few relatives, everyone they had ever known, traded it all in for a lifetime of solitary confinement in a Scarsdale mini mansion. There they were driving down to Brighton Beach once a month to pick up contraband caviar and tangy kielbasa. All around them, the strange new Russians in cheap leather jackets, women wearing wedding cakes of perm blonde hair on their heads, an utterly alien race that just happened to cluck away in the mother tongue and, at least in theory, shared the Gershkin's religion. Were Vladimir and his parents Petersburg snobs? Perhaps. Bad Russians? Likely. Bad Jews? Most certainly. Normal Americans? Not even close. So I will uh, oops. have a little drink. Continue to the last part. So this is toward the end of the book. Uh, let me tell you what's happened. Uh, Vladimir Gershkin has had a choice to either um, become a consultant for Arthur Anderson or to join the Russian Mafia. 
and uh, I think very wisely he has decided to join the Russian Mafia. And so he finds himself in a city called Prava, which is the Prague of Eastern Europe at this point. Uh, the, sorry, the, <coughs> Prague is, the Paris of Eastern Europe. The Prague is what it actually is, Freudian slip. Uh, and he finds himself in this place, and he's working for a gentleman named the Groundhog, a Russian mafioso. And his job is to create a pyramid scheme to defraud very wealthy Americans from their parents' money. And uh, so at this stage, he is going on a double date. He has a very square American girlfriend from Ohio named Morgan. So the groundhog uh, and his girlfriend, Liana, is on a double date with our hero, Vladimir, and his uh, very straight uh, girlfriend, uh, Morgan, from Ohio. And they're at an American theme restaurant called Road 66. So how did you two meet, Morgan asked. The groundhog smiled nostalgically. Eh, his big story, he said. I tell it? Okay. So one day, Groundhog is in Dnepropetrovsk, so he is in eastern Ukraine, and many people are doing to him bad thing. And so Groundhog is doing to them also very bad thing. And uh, time goes tick, 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 tick on the clock. And after two revolvements of the clock needle, it is Groundhog who is alive, and it is enemies of him who are uh, dead. Wait, said Morgan, do you mean, metaphorically speaking, they're dead, Vladimir said. So, the groundhog continued, it's finished bad business, but groundhog's still very lonely and very sad. Aye, my Tolia, said Lena. You see, Morgan, he has Russian soul. Do you know what it is, Russian soul? It's very nice, Vladimir said. Vladimir's boss continued, so, okay, a lonely groundhog has nobody at Dnepropetrovsk. His cousin killed himself last year. Dyadya Lyosha, distant relative, he died from drink. So he's Finnish. No family, no friend, nothing. Biedny moy surok, said Lena. How do you say in English? My poor groundhog. You know, I can totally understand you, Morgan said. It's so difficult to go to a strange town, even in America. I went to Dayton once. I was in a basketball camp. Anyway, the hog interrupted. So groundhog is alone at Dnepropetrovsk, and his bed is very cold, and there is no girl for him to lie down on. And so he is going to, how do you say, uh, dom, the house of the public? You know what this is? Lena dipped a lone curly fry into a pool of hot sauce. House of girl, maybe, she suggested? Yes, yes, exactly such house. And so he is sitting down, and Madame is coming in, and she is introducing Hog to such and such girl. And Groundhog is like, tu, tu. He is spitting on the ground because it's so ugly. One maybe has face black like a gypsy, another having big nose, another speaking some pygmy language, not Russian. And Groundhog is looking for, you know, special girl. He's very cultured, Lena said, patting his enormous hand. Tolia, you should declaim for Morgan famous poema by Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin called, uh, she looked at Vladimir, the bronze horseman, Vladimir guessed? Yes, correct. Bronze Horseman, very beautiful poema. Everybody knows such poema. It is about famous statue of man on horse. Lena, please, I am telling interesting story, the hog shouted. So Groundhog is leaving house of girl, but then he's hearing beautiful sound from room of love. Ok, ok, ok. It is like wonderful Slavic angel. Ok, ok, ok. Voice tender like young girl. Ok, ok, ok. He is asking Madame, tell me, who is making ok? Madame is saying, oh, is our Lenochka making such ok? But she's only for valuta, for, you know, hard currency. Groundhog is like, I have dollar, Deutsche Mark, Finnish Mark, no, what do you want? So Madame is saying, okay, sit down on the divan for 20 minutes and soon you will have this Lena. So Groundhog sitting and sitting and he is hearing this beautiful awk sound, like bird singing to another bird. And he is suddenly becoming, uh, how do you say Vladimir? He whispered a word in Russian. Well, Vladimir said, he looked to Morgan, her face was ashen and she was nervously twisting a drinking straw around one white finger as if applying a tourniquet. Engorged, I guess, Vladimir translated. Yes, Groundhog is becoming engorged in the foyer and he's shouting, Lena, Lena, Lenochka, and in the room of love she's shouting, ok, 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 and it is like duet, it is like Bolshoi opera, shit. And so he gets up, still gorged, and he runs down quickly to local Laryok and he's buying beautiful flowers. Yes, Lena said. He is buying scarlet roses, just like in my favorite song, A Million Scarlet Roses by Alla Pugacheva. So I know God is watching us. 
And also, said the groundhog, I am buying expensive chocolate candy in the shape of ball. Yes, Lena said. I remember from Austria with each ball having picture of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. I once studied music in Kiev Conservatory. They looked at each other and briefly smiled, mumbling a few words in Russian. Vladimir thought he heard the endearment, which meant roughly, you're my little swallow. The hog quickly smooched Lena and then looked back at his table mates, a little embarrassed. Ah, the groundhog said, losing the thread of his tail for a moment. Yes, lovely story. So I run up to house of girl, and Lena is already finished with her bad business, and she is washing up, but I don't care. I open door to her room, and she is standing there, wiping with towel, and I have never seen this. Oh, skin white, hair red, boже мой, boже мой, oh my God, Russian beauty. I am getting down on my foot, and I give her flower, and Mozart ball, and, and he looked to Lena, and then to Vladimir, and then back to his beloved. He put his hand to his heart, and he whispered. And so four months later, we are here with you at table, the practical Lena summed up for him. So tell me, she asked the near catatonic Morgan, how did you meet Vladimir? Thank you. So that was a wonderful story. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I also like the sort of autobiographical story you uh, told me, uh, told us, um, and uh, especially this, uh, the thing with uh, your sadness at never finishing your first novel, or a first novel, again. Um, but what interests me is why did you do this in Russia? Why did you go? I'm sort of fascinated by the fact that you apparently keep going back and <laughs> because it's such a different country. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. I keep uh, returning back for uh, because uh, in a sense I feel that my psychic center is um, is still in Russia. And when I land there and I see the the unhappiness of people and their constant fear, these are things that I grew up with, and I think they they mean something to me. The sense of uh, and also the humor. You know, there's, it's not all gloom and doom. There's a lot of, I think, some of my Russian friends are the funniest people I know. And uh, just having an evening with them, splitting a vodka bottle with some friends, and this, you just write down the material. It's almost journalism at some point because it's just so wonderful. It's a very rich cu country in terms of uh, finding fiction, and I know that others have done so as well, uh, even those without a Russian background. We were talking earlier about, uh, you probably know the German writer Ingo Schurz. Yes. So... Uh, I think many people find a lot of uh, good things in the former Soviet Union in terms of uh, using it for fiction. Yes, but it's such a different, because the book, of course, is about, not about Soviet Union, but about capitalist Russia. Yes, in some ways, yes, it is. Um, I think that the failure of communism for many of us, uh, we, we would think it would presage the beginning of a happy capitalist era and an era when the West would embrace Russia and that there would be some kind of, uh, not just detente, but a rapprochement of all the many years which, that have passed. But I think the reality for many Russians has been very different. The West is not here to help Russia. The West is, of course, looking out for its own interests as well as it should. And I think that for many Russians, there's been a kind of, a, at least many of the adult Russians I know, there's been a feeling of being let down, and America especially being in the country that, that has let Russia down. So I think there's a lot of this uh, in, in, in the fiction. In what way does, has uh, America let Russia down? No, I'm not saying that it has, but I think the feeling is that, uh, well, certainly in the political climate right now, excuse me, where um, Russia has found itself to be irrelevant militarily, economically, politically. It's a country on the sidelines. Uh, and I think in some ways you can say that also Europe feels uh, the same way. Uh, but this is less a reaction of what is happening in Russia than what the United States seems to be doing as a, the remaining global superpower and one that doesn't, uh, doesn't pull its punches, but <laughs> rather just punches. Well, being politically irrelevant isn't such a bad thing, perhaps. Perhaps, but for Russians, I, I think politically relevant is not so bad. Uh, it's a part of that cult of mediocrity that I really enjoy. Um, 
but I think what, what, it, what the difference may be is that uh, Russians grew up feeling that we were a part of a great empire. Whether you hated the Soviet Union or not, that was sort of implicit in the statues and the slogans and everything around us. So it was interesting because I grew up in a failing empire and then I moved to the world's remaining empire. And some of what is happening recently makes me feel it's almost deja vu in a sense of the last days of the Soviet empire when military action was dispatched in all corners to try to stave off some sense of collapse. I'm not saying that America will collapse in the next 10 years, but I think some, some of this reaction really does remind me of, of, uh, of Gorbachev's last stand in Baku and in, um, in the Baltics. So, yes. Instead of the, 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 maybe the political relevance has collapsed insofar as it ever existed, but isn't there a sense of a cultural, big cultural re relevance? Well, uh, I deal primarily, obviously, with, with literature. And I think for the Russian, literature is as important as it always has been. Russians put so much stock in literature that, you know, during the Soviet times when religion was banned, the literature was its own religion in a sense, and people worshipped it more than it was. As a writer, it's something very beautiful, obviously, but I think people also put almost too much stock in it. And in present uh, times, there are only a handful of very good Russian writers. Uh, I can name them uh, Viktor Pilevin, who you may know, uh, Vladimir Sorokin, and uh, Tatiana Tolstaya, who is the great grandniece of, of Leo Tolstoy. Mm -hmm. Not a very pleasant woman, but a good writer nonetheless. <laughs> and um, don't, don't quote me if you meet her. Um, but it seems that all of the work that is being done now in Russia is in reaction to the terrible political, well, more so economic crises that the people have undergone. And it seems that character development has not been very successfully attempted. And there have been novels which are really not about people at all, but more about just the ways ideas circulate. And that's, for me, that could be somebody's cup of tea, but it's not, it's not mine. So isn't Brooklyn, uh, where, 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 where you live and where a lot of writers live, isn't that sort of a new little Leningrad where <laughs> culture is the, the all-important thing? Brooklyn, the new Leningrad. I think that's a, <laughs> we can have that as a, and the bridge, and the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, Yes, yes. I am happy to be, uh, to live in a part of America, one of the few parts in America, well, San Francisco, Boston also, but where there is so much cultural activity that it's almost too much at times, and I, I love to escape it because it's, you know, it's a, it really feels like a, like a cultural enterprise. It feels almost like a cultural fraternity, you know, in American colleges there are fraternities and sororities. And, so it's, uh, no, it's very hardy, and I think a lot of the work that's being done is very good at this point. Um, in America, um, especially among many immigrant writers. Um, I'm not going to say myself, but uh, certainly many Indian American writers, Akhil Sharma, um, Jhumpa Lahiri. I don't know if you've. Have you, in, in Holland, do you hear of these people? Lahiri just, might be. She won the Pulitzer Prize. Her... Oh, yes, yes, you should get her to come. She's a magnificent woman. Um, so a lot of this has been a kind of uh, exploration through the eyes of immigrants. And I think the traditional immigrant novel, as you said, in America, I think is pretty much dead. I, I come across one every once in a while where there's a striving young woman usually and she overcomes terrible women, you know. And in the end, everything is, is wonderful and it's sold right to the movies and off we go with Jennifer Lopez in the star role of, you know. But I think, and Chang Ray Lee is somebody I should thank, my mentor uh, who was here previously, is one of the first people I read. I picked up, he and I have a completely different style. I, I, I try to be humorous, and he obviously, you know, he's sometimes funny, but that's not his, uh, that's not what he really does. But I picked up some of his work, and I read it, and I thought, oh my God, this is one of the first real representations of what it means to be an immigrant in the 1990s. And it was shocking. I mean, the use of language was wonderful and all these things as well, but what really shocked me was just the fact that he could say these things about parents. And I see it uh, happening now all the time. There was this wonderful new writer called Suki Kim, another Korean writer who just published a book. And, uh, <laughs> and she was interviewed by some big newspaper, and she said, the first thing we as immigrant writers must do is kill our parents. <laughs> and I said, well, it's a little extreme. I'm just trying to get mine deported, you know. And, so, but it was, it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon, I think. So what is the new uh, immigrant novel except killing your parents? Yes, yeah, this, this kind yes, of Yes, of course, yeah. but you, you're saying there's a bunch of writers who, who, who uh, 
would be writing the new immigrant novel. So perhaps there's, there's, it's possible to, to generalize about it. Yeah, I mean, one way I can generalize is this. I think that this... Because if I may interrupt, sure. if you say kill your parents, that's still a Portnoy's complaint, I would say. Right, right. I think the biggest change is that this literature is what I like to call global literature. And in the sense that the one thing that has changed since Portnoy's and Saul Bellow's characters is that immigrants once came to this country, uh, to this country, I'm, the jet lag, I still think I'm somewhere in New York, but it's not usually this attractive. The, it's the language. It's the language, right? You're no, talking No, no. The one thing that has changed is the, the idea, I think, of mobility. Uh, immigrants would come and they would stay. There was no return ticket if you came from Lithuania in 1907. You weren't going back to your shtetl in, in, you know, in Lithuania. But now we all go back. And there's the sense of, and Vladimir Gershkin goes back. He fails in America. He goes right, right back home. You know? And I know many Americans who have failed in their lives in New York or in Boston who have gone to Russia to, to, because there they can succeed in a sense because the bar is set so low in, in many ways. So there's this incredible ping-pong effect, this ricochet back and forth between uh, where you came from and where you are to the point where you start to lose any sense of what is a homeland uh, and the very sense of divided loyalties culturally, if not... Um, I mean, this, this political situation is, 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 is interesting as well. Just to, This is the first time in my life, and I never thought this would happen, when I think that the position of the Russian president <laughs> makes more sense and is more eloquently stated than the position of the American president. So I think... Uh, it's, it's, and it's shocking, because I grew up despising Russian leadership, and I still find Putin to be a fairly obnoxious man. But So it's a, it's a whole new ball game in that sense, and I think it's because we are able, look, we get on a plane, nine hours, I'm in Moscow. You know, it doesn't... But perhaps the idea would be that America is no longer the ideal place where you have to prove yourself it's no bad thing if you fail in America and you try it someplace else. Well, that sort of is one of the theses of this book, but I think in reality, America expects success and only success. Uh, it does not tolerate failure, I don't think, on any level. Not that I know. Certainly New York doesn't tolerate failure. I don't know how it is in Nebraska, but um, there is a culture of success. There is a culture of constant measurement, financial measurement, social measurements. I'm sure this exists in Europe as well to a different extent, but in America, I think this is a huge part of... And I think the earlier books, you know, look at Sinclair, look at Babbitt. You know, I think these, these are the precursors to this in this sense. So I, I'm not inventing anything new. No writer really invents anything new. You just, like a DJ, you pick up some strands here and you turn the turntable and something different comes out. So tell me a little bit, if you want to, about, um, for instance, Oberlin College. You told me that you were sort of fetishized by your professors because you were, were from Eastern Europe yes. and you were Jewish. Uh, yes, yes, they loved it. They said, you know, you will be our new comrade. So they called me Comrade Steingart. They saluted me when I walked in the hall. One of them had a red phone, and he would call me in my dorm. This was when the Soviet Union was just collapsing, and he would call me and say, is it really over? Please say no. And I would say, just relax, have a nice single malt scotch, smoke your Cuban cigar, everything's going to be okay. It wasn't. So for my senior thesis, they asked me to write something, you know, talk about cynicism. They said, you know, they said well, maybe you can write something that would make us all feel a little better. You know. So I wrote this thesis about how the Soviet Union should one day come together and attack America. and It was the best piece of fiction I ever wrote. And it was, it was called Back in the USSR was the name of it. And it won the highest prize the college gave. And it was a big parade, I think, in my honor, you know, with tanks and missiles. <laughs> I stood in the mausoleum with my... Uh... So Marxism actually, is the only place where it is alive would be in liberal arts colleges yes. in the U.S. But it's very comfortable Marxism because it's, you know, you know that it won't really affect anything. I, I had this professor and at one point, I think it was his servant or something, ran into the room with a piece of cheese from France that was elegantly wrapped in these little bows and he said, ah, the people's cheese. When we ate it. it was, but so, you know, I love, but that sense of hypocrisy is something that just is so much a part of Russian humor and Soviet humor as well. I mean, this is what we grew up with. So, I was having a wonderful time in Oberlin, and I had another friend, you know, and he kept calling me the weasel because I sort of participated in all this. And there was a Russian professor who knew that I was also writing, uh, writing, starting my book in college. And he said once, he said, yes, he is a weasel, but there is something of the artist in him as well. And that was a, a wonderful compliment. A weasel artist. So... The book is, to a large extent, it's well, not to a large extent, but to a significant extent, it's a satire of 
both America and Russia. The Francesca episode you uh, you read, of course, is it's not a pretty picture. No, it's not. N none of there are no pretty tableaus here at all. I, I've never met a, a culture I couldn't skewer. It's it's easy to, and I think it is the job of the satirists to do so. The governments all have their propaganda machines and different aspects, parts of societies all have their own sort of propaganda machines, not formally perhaps, but, and I think it's the job of a satirical writer to try to, uh, to show the truth in some ways. And I think a lot of people get very upset. This book has upset a lot of people as well. Uh, people from all walks of life, Russian, American, Jewish, and people have said, you know, that's me you're writing about it, and it's not funny. And it's their prerogative. I, you know, you may agree or disagree, and um, but uh, this is what I this is what I do, and it's not just me. It's a long tradition from Goncharov, from Oblomov to Turgenev to uh, Gogol, of course, Dead Souls. I mean, this is what we grew up with. This is our birthright, in a sense, to to write this kind of stuff. And uh, being a Russian is no fun, as some of you may know. It's not a, not a bowl of cherries, but at least uh, sometimes uh, art can be, uh, or what I pray is something close to art, uh, can be produced from the. Uh, Proceedings. So, as a satirist, you, you, your models are Russian writers. They are not like Swift or, or even uh, no, Swift is, Bellow. Swift. Has well, no, no, no. There's some from Bellow. Also, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan, and I'm trying to sort of rehabilitate him. The, uh, the Canadian writer Mordecai Richler. I don't know if you have heard from him. Who he's is? He's been here. He's been here. Yes. Oh, my sole regret in life is never having met him. Uh, but uh, last week or two weeks ago, I was in Montreal for a week. Uh, following his footsteps and eating everything he ate, which meant, you know, eating a, a cow a day was our... Um, but he was drinking bottles and bottles of booze. My liver is applying for asylum in the Netherlands. And, uh, you know, and it was a very interesting experience because he is a brilliant satirist. Mm -hmm. But he managed to offend just about all of Canada. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this very nice article about him, and quickly the French Canadians started sending in things, saying, how can you say that about Richler? He hated us. He never spoke a word of French. There was a lot of Anglophone, Francophone tensions, obviously, in Quebec. So, you know, you have to tread lightly, but at the same time, you have to know, you have to not fear stepping on somebody's toe, because this is, otherwise it's pointless what we do. Well, Canada, of course, is, is a bad place uh, for being a satirist. <laughs> yes. They're very touchy. So, how... How come you never wrote any short stories? I mean, the usual trajectory for for a writer is to pu first publish a couple of short stories, and then there's the first novel. I mean, the amazing thing about your novel is that it's really the first thing you've ever pu published, and it's so accomplished. But why did you never? How come? Well, I have this, uh, you know, my favorite animal is the elephant. I think he's big, <laughs> and I think he uh, really gets his job done. He walks across the landscape. The landscape shakes, you know, trees fall, mongooses scamper, and I think uh, in the novel as well. There's so many things you could do with a novel that you can't do with a short story. Uh, the novel is, uh, lets you play with a deck of 50 cards instead of a deck of three. And um, not to say that short stories can often be as brilliant and even more skillful than the novel. The work of Chekhov, of course, speak for themselves. Um, but at this point, I also had so many ideas. I was 23, 22 when I started. I had lived in Prava, Prague, uh, and had seen, and I just had so much on my chest, and I just wanted to. It just started writing, and it became 700 pages. It, it grew to even more than that. You know, it was just this expanding octopus, and it took up more than half a decade of my life. Everything I saw I would write about. There was a chapter about Amsterdam at one point. Thank God it's gone. It was, it was awful. Uh, juvenilia. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, I just couldn't stop. And I'm glad I did it this way. I think now I will maybe narrow my scope just a tad and focus on just a few things in the next novel. But I'm glad the first effort is, should be a, a giant free-for-all. Zadie Smith, I think, is another author who went uh, whole hog, so to speak, on her first novel. But how can you... Because that's probably why people write, start with stor short stories, because it's so hard to keep working on a book for five or six years without any recognition. I mean, how did you keep going? This was the best part of my life. I know, but this was it. tell us about it. Well, I would come home. Uh, for, I, would, uh, I had to work. In America, for some of you maybe are Americans, people work day and night. Uh, I used to work for a lawyer who had a little bed in his office, you know, and he kept saying, why don't you sleep over, you know? <laughs> I said, screw you, I'm a writer. 
Um, so I would work in these different places and, of course, dream of, of, of publishing the work. But then I would come home, and writing it, there was such a sense of, well, almost like a, a, a naughty boy doing what he shouldn't be doing, and of, of typing up all these different uh, satirical aspects of things. And, um, <laughs> and then I would switch other jobs, and I would lock the door and work on the novel, and I kept getting fired. In America, if you don't produce, it's not the Soviet Union, you're gone, you know. So I was fired many, many times. Uh, and, but still, it was socially I felt very awkward as well. Perhaps issues of assimilation were still haunting me. Uh, psychologically, I was a mess. Good God, you know. Oof, can't believe I survived those years. So the one thing that held together for all that time, not that it's such a long time, but over half a decade, was sitting down at the computer and I would just have this smile on my face when, it, when, I, had to, when I had to write. And I don't have that same pleasure anymore because I can do this now as a living. <laughs> And people know that you're doing it. And people know it, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, you never have that again. The fight is over, I won, who cares? Sp speaking of fights, um, you told me that you were part of a writer's march against the war, because we, oh, have, no, to, no, we, of course, just... we have to talk about the war. <laughs> no, there was a march, and uh, I, myself and another writer, and we were kidding about we should have a sign saying you know, writers against the war. There was no <laughs> it was a very nebulous affair down Broadway, just what, two days? I don't know what... So the two of you had a march. The two of us had a march, which is perfect, you know, sort of a Stalinist march, you know, two people against the system. It's, we changed everything. Didn't the war stop? I, I believe it stopped. It's going not as good anymore. Uh, yeah, yeah. The the Bush said, the oh, if the writers are against us, then... <laughs> the morale has dropped. <laughs> yeah, right. The lot of morale is... He said, next the poets? What? No, no, we can't. So it's interesting to be, uh, you know, in a, in a society where... Because in Belgium, I think you were in Belgium a couple of days before, and someone said that maybe they should boycott your book because you're an American writer. Yes, yes, I was on a, a Belgian youth radio. This is the, not the, the, the Flemish part. Uh, and they said, yes, we want to boycott Steingart's book. Yeah. And I said, uh, are you crazy? I said, you should boycott Coca-Cola and Philip Morrison and all these other things. But my book, I'm trying to help you guys, you know. And I think they took it to heart, and I, I think they won't boycott it. The seven Belgian readers who are going to buy it probably won't now, so it's a tragedy for Benelux literature. I think it's time for maybe a question from the floor, if there's any. Yes? So we have to wait for the microphone. I'd like to know what some of the reactions from your friends have been, the ones that grew up with you and also the ones that are living in the, in the US. Mm. SR. The USSR. Well, uh, among the friends, I don't have too many Russian friends, but I think one of the most wonderful in, Ru in America, in Russia I have friends, but uh, and I, I think that's been a conscious choice to sort of try to surround myself. I speak with my parents, God, daily, you know, they call, so <laughs> there's almost too much Russian in my life right there. Um, but among, it's been wonderful, the, most, the best thing about this novel since it came out has been traveling around the country and having Russian immigrants of my generation who are now 29, 30 come out and say, thank you for writing this because this is our lives and nobody else has done it and nobody else has uh, understood it. And, um, uh, and uh, all the other immigrant groups we know have at least three or four novels to their credit. Uh, if you're, you know, uh, so that's been a very nice part. Uh, my friends in Russia are having trouble with the language in this book. It will be translated uh, in Russian probably horrifically by, uh, by next year by a place called Phantom Publishing. So, <laughs> Sounds mafioso. Yes, yeah, so, uh, I'm sure there's also Phantom Bagels and Phantom Waterworks and... <laughs> All different things. So we we shall see what their reply is. But already some Russians in Russia have been very angry, who have read and, and got the book and said, "You're you're making, you know, there's a famous saying in Russian, Asala ruskaya idiot,' which means they complain, but yet they're still eating our lard, you know. So that's the sense. Of, I eat the lard. I and also I went to a, a conference at, at Harvard. I, I I was the speaker at Harvard University, and I, you know, did my little song and dance. And uh, in the end, they. Um, the professors yelled for minutes and hours about you know whether I was the colonizer or the colonized, 
whether I was appropriating my immigrant experience and all this, you know, back and forth. And in the end, I said, well, did anybody read the book? And they said, no, no, no. <laughs> I said, well, we don't read texts, you know, we just, we just talk about them. <laughs> so. But are you looking forward to the book being published in Russia? Because I could... Thank Imagine you. that you feel very victorious about the fact that... Yeah, <laughs> these are small victories, but uh, I'll take oh. them. This is not Borodino, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> the Finnish-Russo War of 1944. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's nice. And it's a one translation. I mean, I understand that there's a beautiful that Brett Bucker... Is that how you use Brent Bucker? Brett Bucker, yeah. Brett Bucker did a wonderful translation in uh, Dutch, but I'm looking at it, and obviously I can't understand the word. Uh, but Russian will be the one language of the many languages that will be published in that, that I cannot... Uh, and I will have control over the, the final proofs, so that's exciting, very exciting. But I understood that your, your dad wasn't able to read the, the book in, in English? He read it, but he missed all the good parts, I think. So Thank God, you know. So do, yeah, I was going to ask, were you relieved? I was relieved, but then in America there was some kind of media thing where they kept interviewing my parents, and and my mother kept saying, "I'm not the mother in that book." So of course they all, all the headlines were, you know, Steingart's mother, mother in book, you know. <laughs> so she was very ready to sue all of them, but she's not really the mother. In so and it's, it's <laughs> the jokes on all of us, I think. Yeah. So is your next book because you seem to be over half. Uh, yeah. Is that uh, an American-Russian book again? No. It, uh, well, in some sense, but not really. It's about, very briefly, it's, it's set in a country called the Absurdistan, which is a Soviet republic uh, that I've invented by the Caspian Sea, which is undergoing a terrible civil war for ethnic, religious, all kinds of reasons. And it's about oil. Oil is at the very... So, you know, the, the great game of political powers is also involved. But at the center of it is this 400-pound uh, gentleman, uh, the son of one of the richest mafioso in Russia. And uh, as this gentleman walks across this landscape, he's also a little bit Oblomov-like in nature. And his dream is to emigrate to the United States one day, but nobody will give him papers because his father has killed an American businessman in Moscow. So it's very complex, but it's about a man and his weight and his trying to lose the weight and it's about a country that falls apart and it's about probably way too many metaphors by now, so I'm going to have to cut at least half of them. Uh, but it should be funny. I just showed it around the first part and people laughed and that's important. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Are there, are Thank there you. any questions yet? Yes. I wondered, I was in Berlin and read a uh, book of Vladimir Kaminer, where there became some sort of Russian disco and Russians became very popular in Berlin. And it's, the book is a, a bit the same, or, or had the same sort of topics as your book. Do you think that something like that is going to happen in, in New York or in the States too? So that there'll be a big, um, that it'll be en vogue at a certain moment, this Russian young writers and a lot of Russian music going on there. Popular. In Germany. Yeah, well, Germany has always understood Russia better in some ways than America simply because of proximity and because of some horrible shared history. Um, and I think, uh, I think that there's a lot of very creative work being done by Russians in, in Berlin. You walk through Berlin. I, used, I spent a summer there, and there was this wonderful place called the Café Hegel. I, maybe you know it. With Big Lutzi was the owner, and she was wonderful. So there's a very creative uh, mix there. Um, so, and a lot of writers I know, one of my favorites is Vladimir Sorokin, and I've been writing about him for the uh, New Yorker uh, magazine, and um, he's kind of pissed off, I think, that in Germany he's considered a very important writer, in America nobody, can, nobody even translates him. So it's something to be said about location, I think, but I'm very glad that there are a lot of Russians rediscovering themselves uh, in Germany, and it's a, certainly a more hospitable climate to create art than in most of Russia. I thought this was pop music coming up from Russia. Yes, yes. Things, are, things were changing, man. Things are changing. Well, yeah. And part of this other or the article that I wrote for the New Yorker was about the the band Tattoo. Do you know this uh, teenage fake lesbian band that I that I enjoy very much? Uh, <laughs> I went to interview them. They're they're not lesbians. They're not really even teenagers. They're I don't think they're band. from Russia. Yeah, they're not a band. <laughs> so, so it's the ultimate in deconstruction. I deconstructed them and. No, nobody can put them together. Uh, no, they're doing very well. They're a big hit, big hit in America. They do this version of, uh, do you know, uh, The Smiths? Do you remember The Smiths? How soon is now? This song. You shut your mouth. How can you say? I go about things the wrong way. I am human and I want to be loved. <laughs> Just like everybody else does. Big hit, big hit. <laughs> And I'm not even a teenage lesbian, so you can imagine. 
<laughs> Anyone else a question? Yes. So I understood you to say that you uh, originally had something like 700 pages for this novel, and now I, I just checked, it's about 500 or 450. 450. Right. Yeah. I'm curious about those other pages. Well, that's uh, should have cut more. What, <laughs> what directions you took the book with those uh, I think they were the directions that I took was, hey, look at me, I'm so clever, I know how to write, you know, and there were pages and pages of me just flattering my ability to put together a sentence and thinking... I was so pathetic. I would buy horrible American books, of which many there are, and I would read them and then read my own work and say, well, mine won't get published, but good God, it's uh, so much happier. And uh, so, But it was complete garbage, uh, and I'm so glad I threw most of it out. Um, and then I met Chang Ray Lee, and he said, he said, it's all almost here. You just need 30 pages. You need to cut deep into the mother with a knife, steak knife. So I did it, and it came out okay. So it was, but mostly it's a question of reduction. Look, I grew up with these giant novels, Crime and Punishment, uh, the Brothers Karamazov, The Idiot. I mean, look, I thought that at least a thousand pages you had to have to, to be considered a novelist. I'm so glad that now in America, 60 pages and you're a rock star. <laughs> what did Vlad Vladimir do in Amsterdam? The usual things, that's why... <laughs> It won't interest anybody to. <laughs> it won't interest you, <laughs> Amsterdamers, because. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you seem to know your way around here. Yeah, it's nice. Horseshoe canals. Yeah. Because we thought that in English, I don't know why the Dutch translators did it with what they did, but in English, you know, if an American sees debutante without an e, it makes no sense to him no. or her that it's a male debutante. So we, we, you know, this was like a three-month discussion of whether we should have. The E was very important to us. But in the end, we said, well, look, no American, why, stum why have people stumble at the cover? Even though grammatically it's a mistake, of course, a male debutante is not with an E. So it's because of our distaste for language. No, we, we just, we did this. But it's interesting because the, uh, the Dutch translation also has it. And um, it's what? interesting to see what the French will do with it. We'll, if, if they will keep it. I seem to recall there was a discussion about uh, the uh, the Dutch uh, uh, title and whether the E should be in. I, I think I was called uh, on the phone about yeah. it, and I said, don't, don't, don't do the E, and then obviously the editor said, well, then we'll do the E. <laughs> well, the next edition, take it out, <laughs> if there is a. It's funny, yes, because in, in English the word is always with an E because it's always a woman who goes to her first ball. No, there, there just balls, isn't, is no. It's, so, a, it's a big thing in America, the debutante ball is... A, yeah. yeah. Hmm? Uh, in Russian, I, I, they haven't told me yet, I imagine it would be something like Rukavosu uh, debutante of America, something like that, which translates literally to a manual for a debutante, for a Russian debutante in America. I don't know. Yeah, debutant, debutant, it would be, not debutantka, debutant. So they would get it right, but I'm sure, <laughs> the people at Phantom, I'm sure, are way too high on, uh, on vodka and, you know, and uh, potato fumes to get, God bless them. They're paying me in goats, they don't even have the... Not cheese? Not cheese, I wish. <laughs> I have to milk my own goat, <laughs> like I have time. Anyone, a last question? Maybe I should thank you for this wonderful talk. Well, I'd like to thank thanks you for as being well. here. Thank you. And thank you all for coming too. Well, thank you. Thank you, Gary, um, for your wonderful you. talk and for your reading. It was very good. Thank you, Hermann, for your introduction for any questions. Thank you, audience, for asking questions too. Um, before um, Gary Steingart will sign his books uh, here, I um, would like to say once more thank you to Bart Bakker, Bert Bakker and also to the publishing house of the, sorry, the book importers ben Penguin, who is uh, selling the, uh, the, I think, the English edition today here. Um, and once more, I think most of you already know that the John Adams Institute is a privately funded organization and only with help of you buying tickets and uh, being our donors, supporters, we can only do this, bring authors to our podium. 
Uh, you can pick up brochures at the um, information stand. There's some more information there also in the next lectures. Um, there's also a questionnaire on your chairs. You would be very um, helpful if you could fill that out for us. Uh, our next lecture is already on April 9th with not an American, but a very British lady, Faye Weldon. And there are still tickets available and um, um, it's also in this church. So you can come over and see us again. And well, once more, thank you all for coming and hope to see you again on the next lecture. Thank you so much.